The anchor verse for this weekend will be on the screens, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. says this, see, this is the Lord promises, this is his promises over us. See, I'm doing a new thing. How many of y'all are grateful for some new things? Come on. This isn't recycled, this isn't refurbished. It's not borrowed from yesterday. You don't have to reach into tomorrow. He says, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? Another translation says, do you not see it? The only way in our humanity that we don't see it is if we're constantly distracted by things contending for our attention. So do you not see? That's why we say all the time, hey, don't let the enemy convince you that you're not blessed because of the things that are happening around you. A a, a boat only sinks because of the water that gets in it, not the water that's around it. So we have to be aware to say, okay, I want to see it. Come on, say it loud. I want to see it. And then this line right here blesses me. I am, this is the Lord God, I am making a way in the wilderness. Say wilderness. We're going to come back to that. And streams in the wasteland. The title of week four of another level, if you're taking down notes, it's on the screens, is The Way in the Wilderness. The Way in the Wilderness. Let's pray. God, I thank you today that you give us ears to hear you. We need a mind sharp and ready to understand it. But God, here's our posture today. We're not going to show up as takers, but we're going to show up open-handed, ready for a deposit from your word. And we're so grateful that your word does not return to you void. God, anoint me to preach this word. Like Paul said, it's not with my enticing words or my perfect oratory delivery. I am fully relying on the demonstration and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you receive it, shout amen. Amen. So we have local, national, and global initiatives that those of you who are faithful in your tithe and your uh, generosity, we take percentages and we fulfill our word to our local, national, and global missions initiatives. Make some noise if you're grateful that we're reaching our city. We're also reaching into the nation, but we also are reaching people in Uganda. We have a beautiful community in Tanzania. We do mission trips literally all the time. We have prison mission trips. We're about to go on a Uganda missions trip. Like It's phenomenal what God does and what he can do with a little. And when we're faithful in the little, God blesses it with much. And the other day, uh, my friend Josh, who's on our team, was like, man, have you, have you ever been on a, like an African safari tour? And I'm like, mm-hmm. And he's like, in Uganda? I said, like, no, not Uganda. He's like, oh, it's beautiful there. He's like, with our Tanzania community? Like, you've been on an African safari tour there? And I was like, not there either. And he's like, but you've been on an African safari tour? I was like, "Mm mm-hmm. And he's like, where? And I was like, it's an African safari tour in Arcola, Illinois. Come on, somebody. (laughs) They take it in all these wild, exotic animals that they're, uh, they've got veterinarians on staff. They have a rehabilitation program. They're trying to, they're trying to get them raised up and healthy again to release them back into the wild. But for a season, they're in captivity. And so all the proceeds when you do the drive through, uh, goes back to supporting these, these animals rehabilitation. And so we're there and I'll be honest, (laughs) this should have just been uh, animal tour. Like they, they had some poorly groomed sheep that I think were labradoodles. Like they had a zebra that was crossed with a horse. They called it a zorse. And then there was this, this was one buddy. His name was Bernie the camel. There's not, there's no chance Bernie could ever be outside of the captivity of Arcola, Illinois ever again, because Bernie did not care what you thought about him. He would walk in front of your car and just stop in front of you and look at you like, yeah, this is happening. Like, I'm not going to leave. And so the entire time, we were just like, this is awesome. And then I'm the dad who's going to end up on a reel because I I rolled both windows down and locked it so the kids couldn't roll it up. And the animals were like, and the kids were like, ah. And she's like, roll the windows up. I'm like, this is great. Video it. Um, Sorry. So I unlocked and then I rolled them up. And this, but Bernie came over to my window. And he kind of banged his face. He's like, boom. He's a big camel. He's banging his face against my window. I was like, has anybody got a Kit Kat? Like, I don't know what you feed these things. Like, I was like, no, Bernie, what are you doing? And he's like banging his nose into my window. And then while making eye contact with him, he never broke eye contact, he proceeded to try to bite my driver's mirror off the Yukon. And he was just like, like, and I was like, this is unbelievable. And some of y'all are like, this story is unbelievable. I don't know why we're talking about it. Because the entire time we were there, I couldn't shake the feeling that Bernie and these other animals didn't quite fit in to this captivity. They didn't quite fit into the Arcola, Illinois safari tour drive through And if you're the owner watching, it was a fantastic time. I just, it's a wonderful experience. Here's the truth. 
The truth is, once these animals have been placed in this captivity after a period of time, they can never be released back into the wild because the efforts to train natural instincts that only happen when they're in the wild, the independence that they need taught, the time-consuming, resource-intensive, way too costly to make it even possible is not something that's worth it so they keep them there for a long time. Some of y'all are like, please tie this into the message. Here's my question for you. What cages has the enemy tried to build around you to try to prevent you from being released into the full scope and capacity that God has destined you to walk in? Because once you have been bound and shackled and you've been in captivity for a while, sometimes in a twisted way, captivity can feel like comfort. Sometimes you end up gravitating back to that toxic relationship and you're like, yeah, I get it, but at least I'm not alone. You end up gravitating back to the thing that used to hold you captive and bound, like that club life, and you're like, yeah, I have a fever and the only prescription is to dance, but you know it leads to other things, and you know you shouldn't be there, but hey, at least I have a little bit of a community, right? So today we're going to be talking about the wilderness, say the wilderness, Some of you are like, wow, this is really, really heavy. But the truth is this. Here's the good news. There's absolutely no problem that we will ever encounter in our lives that God in his unfailing kindness has not created a solution for. Somebody should give God praise because here's the truth. The topic is heavy, but we are not without hope because when we simply call upon the name of Jesus as sons and daughters, that's when everything changes. I was with my boy Brandon Lake the other night at his uh, concert that he had at 713 Hall. And Brandon said something that I loved, and, I, and he said, you, you realize that, that God doesn't have any grandkids. We're all his kids. From the youngest to the oldest, he looks at you as his own. And maybe you came in here, maybe you came in on broken pieces, and our prayer this weekend is that you would leave with the peace of God, that you would swap out the broken places for the breakthrough that God can do in your life. We have a God who spares no expense, no effort and wastes no opportunity to see us restored and rehabilitated from the areas of our lives that maybe the enemy has been trying to hold you captive in. Look at this promise in the word, Galatians 4, 7 on the screens. Now you are no longer a slave, that's good news. Another translation says you are no longer held captive, but you're God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. There's an inheritance connected to you. You, you. you are claimed by him. Have you ever like been somewhere and like you're, like you're supposed to have VIP and you're supposed to get in and you were on a list to get in and then people are like, what's your name? Mm-mm, I don't have you here on this list. Nope, you're not supposed to be. And then somebody walks around the corner and says, oh no, they're with me. And that ever happened to anybody else? Nobody? Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> God spares no expense. He will not, listen, it says that that the good shepherd, this is where the parable comes into place and says that the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. He sent his only son to hang on a cross for you because he said you were valuable because he said you were worth it. And then he wants to show up and fight for us to help us be released from captivity, not just back in the wild, back into the wild where we don't have the instincts for things that we're not prepared for, But God wants to equip us with what we need and release us into our purpose, our future, our inheritance, the supernatural favor that belongs to us. Why? Because Jesus paid for the the entire tab in full. And and often in his kindness, this is key though, it requires a season that we like to call rehabilitation or restoration that God would call the wilderness. All throughout the Bible, Because in our humanity, we're like, hey, real quick, can I just opt out? Can I just click the thing and unsubscribe from the wilderness seasons? But the truth is, if you want to go from here to a place called there, there is a middle season. And oftentimes, it looks like the wilderness. Look at the person next to you and say, it's getting a little heavy. I'll be honest, it's getting a little heavy. Normally, he's funnier than this. Normally, he's a little funnier. So I'm going to talk today, because I love, how many of y'all are Bible nerds, like you love to dive deep into it? You're like, I would say I'm a theologian, I mean, maybe a little bit. Like, yeah, how many of y'all like enjoy the Bible like you? Some of y'all are like, I read it, I do, and I'm learning, and I'm a student of the Bible. I'm going to go a little biblical history today, go into the biblical lineage of some things, and today we're going to be talking about the Israelites in the days of Moses and the faithfulness that God displayed through them as he brought them from one level 
to another, one promise to the next. For many of us today, I believe if you will tune your ears in, you will be able to find yourselves in today's text. And this weekend, I pray that if you hear nothing else, that you would leave with a shifting of a mindset that says, I'm just constantly, Pastor Daniel, living in a constant state of valley moments. Like, not valley girl moments. Like, ah, oh, that's, that's awesome. I'm like, valley. Like, valley and mountaintop, but you're in, the, you're in the valley. Like, I feel like I'm always in a perpetual wilderness. How many of y'all have been in a wilderness for a minute? Come on. How many of y'all just got out of a wilderness? Okay, cool. Well, get ready because you're probably about to enter another wilderness. And I'm going to show you how God moves in the midst of it. Because watch this. Sometimes it's on the screens. A miracle mindset is only experienced through a wilderness moment. The things that God has equipped Pastor Jackie and I and our kids with is not typically on the mountaintop moments. It's typically in the wilderness moments. It's typically equipping us with some of y'all, let me, let me say it this way. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, those that wait, look for, expect, and hope in him will gain new strength. It goes on and talks about how you will run and not grow weary. How many of y'all love this verse? You will walk and not faint. Some of y'all came in this weekend ready to faint, and you're gonna leave here this weekend ready to fight. And you're gonna realize that God is equipping you and giving you everything you need not to just survive life. I'm preaching better than you're responding. He's not just equipping you with things to survive life, but to thrive in life and the truth is, it's all about perspective and how God works in the midst of the wilderness. So let me set this up, Exodus chapter two, verse 23 and 25. It's pretty self-explanatory. During those days, the king of Egypt died. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue, they were under the regime of some wild kings and dictators. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So to give you some context here in biblical lineage, we see that God made a covenant with Abraham to make him the father of many nations. How many of y'all know that story? Okay. Abraham gave birth to two sons with two wives. God chose to bless the lineage of Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, who God later changed his name to Israel, and Israel was blessed to be fruitful, and the nation was born from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's lineage, but due to their disobedience, that's key, due to their disobedience, I say this all the time, obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. It's not always fun. Like choosing the path of integrity, choosing the path of good character, choosing the path, the path of obedience, sometimes it's not that fun, but it is fruitful. You may not see it instantly, but in the span of your life, you will see the hand of God navigate over and over and show up and have his faithfulness revealed. But due to their disobedience and disregard of honoring God's covenant with them, they found themselves placed in captivity rather than walking in the blessing of God's provision. And y'all, for biblical like context purposes, this captivity wasn't short. Some of you are like, how long was it? A couple of hours and they got bailed out? It was for 430 premium years. That's a long time. 430 years. So this went on not only in their generation, but it was passed on for generation after generation. You might wonder why this is important because 430 years was long enough that the Israelites no longer remembered that they used to be free, that they used to be an independent people. But God raised up a man named Moses who walked with boldness and had a zeal and passion for his people. And side notes again for you Bible geeks in the room, Moses, after fleeing Egypt, was placed in exile for 40 years. God literally placed him in the wilderness, in exile, for 40 years before he ever came back to lead the Israelites out of captivity. What's fascinating about this is that Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness before the Israelites ever did. God placed Moses, his chosen leader, in the wilderness because he knew, he knew if I could equip him now, then he'll know how to lead them later. So Moses could lead the Israelites. Even though they were gonna wander and wonder what's next, Moses could walk with confidence where the Israelites would only see chaos. Dr. Hagen said something so prolific in a conversation. He said, you know, in your lifetime, you will pass over the same dirt twice. One time, you'll pass over it to learn. The next time you pass over it, you'll be equipped to lead. How many guys, that's happened in your life? 
I know Pastor Jackie and I, now be, being married almost 20 years, well, next year, I'm kind of getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> it's just been 19 and some change, but still. 22 years, best friends. I remember throughout the years, we've had a lot of wilderness moments. We've had moments that felt like, where are you, God? But you know what happened in those seasons? God equipped us with weaponry we didn't have. He equipped us with tools in our toolbox that we didn't know we needed. It's like walking in and you have a Phillips, but you needed a flathead. I would like to say uh, I had a banner year coaching my son Fox's t-ball team, but we might have gotten third place. I know, that's what you guys say, oh. And then somebody should shout out, don't stop coaching, though. Thank you. All right, guys, I'll do it again next year. Okay, anyways, <laughs> somebody broke the T. There's two T's. There's one on the championship field that is like a phenomenal T. And then our third and fourth place game over here, the T was like laying on its side like, nah, I'm not even gonna play anymore. Y'all are not that good. And we could not fix it. The bolt was stripped. Why are you telling us this? One of the dads on the team said, I think I have an idea. I have a tool for that. He was equipped in that moment where we were almost gonna have to throw in the towel or I was gonna just <laughs> volunteer somebody to hold the ball. <laughs> and hopefully, bink, not get hit with one of those metal bats. These kids are like herding cats. Like, it's, it's a lot. Um, anyways, so he comes back with some screws and a drill, and we permanently mount the T to the base, and he's like, that's not going anywhere. And I'm like, yeah, and they're gonna have to throw it out afterwards, because it's, but it worked for the game, amen, and the rest of the games, okay. But in the wilderness seasons, in the seasons of exile, in the seasons where you're wondering, God, what are you doing? He's equipping you with tools for the future. He's equipping you with what you need that you will have access to later and say, ah, oh, I've been here before, and he gave me a weapon for this moment. He gave me a spiritual weapon of wisdom and clarity and direction and discernment, which we need a lot of. So he put Moses in a place to walk in confidence so that he could lead the Israelites out of this broken place who only saw chaos. I felt this strong putting this sermon together for all the parents in the room. Wave at me if you're a mom or a dad. Come on. Maybe God has entrusted you to a season so that you can be a guide instead of just a guardian. Instead of just oversighting what God has called you to, maybe he's also gonna speak prophetically through you to help guide and navigate because, hey, look at me, I've been here before. That heartbreak that seems like it's gonna ruin your life at 14, I've been there. There's something about walking through things and growing through them, not just going through them, but growing through them I, every week we help somebody, young parents, somebody with a new baby, somebody that's walking through a situation. And yeah, we haven't, we haven't lived 40 years of marriage yet. We're still learning from those people, which is amazing. But what we have been equipped with in wilderness seasons and just a thing called life, we have tools and weaponry now to be able to speak into others. How many of y'all are grateful for mentors and people that can speak into you and then you can pour into others? Businessmen or businesswoman in, in the room, maybe God has entrusted a difficult press, process to you right now so that you can be equipped to sustain the livelihood of employees that God's entrusted you with in the midst of the fear and the whisperings of economic uncertainties. Maybe God has equipped you. I love talking to people. My grandpa, and uh, I was talking to an older gentleman who was around my grandpa's age, and he talked to me one day about the Great Depression. Some of y'all are like, what's that? Google it. It's wild the different economic struggles throughout history. And he had this, I've seen this before. Yeah, it looks a little different. It's represented a little different because of social media and TikTok and all those things. But when you've seen the ebb and flow of struggle and you've not only survived it, but you came through it on the other side of it, you can say with confidence, hey, this too shall pass. Not only because the word says it, because you've been through it before. Now, will avocados continue to be like $9 a piece? Probably. Leader in the room, maybe the seasons, all the leaders in the room, maybe the seasons that you've gone through of isolation, of challenges, of emotional difficulty, even days of lack, maybe they've been necessary to your calling so that like Moses, you can lead a people from a, from, for, into a miracle mindset and lead them into a heavenly perspective that even though we're going through it, look at me, we're gonna choose to grow through it. Elbow the person next to you and say, I'm, I'm growing. 
and it's uncomfortable, but I'm growing. I tell our oldest son this. I said this last, or two weeks ago. My son's 14. He's like, oh, I'm just hurting. My legs are hurting. My arm is just hurting. I'm like, buddy, you're growing. Like, he's growing so fast. Like, he's already passed his mom up. At, at a young, I'm 6'4". At a young age, he, they told us he was going to be like 6'7". So he's growing. And he's like, do you ever feel like this? I said, what's well, different? Like, if I sneeze now, I throw out a rib. Like, it's, <laughs> it's different. It's okay. So today as we jump into our three takeaways, here's the first thing I want to focus on. Number one, write it down, the weight in the wilderness. Not W-A-I-T, the W-E-I-G-H-T, the weight, the heaviness. Again, point number one, the weight in the wilderness. What is the weight in the wilderness? It's the fear, bless you, the uncertainty, the not knowing or the not knowing how that comes with wilderness seasons. How am I going to get through this? I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel where everything has been uprooted and you have no idea how you're gonna move forward. Y'all, the not knowing and the not seeing in our humanity is the thing that wears us out. And I say this all the time, the enemy knows he can't take you out, but he's gonna try to wear you out. And so in the wilderness season, you have to encourage yourself through the word, put your faith in God. And going back to the anchor verse, knowing that God is making a way in the wilderness. He's springing up fresh water in the dry Wastelands. I remember a beautiful wilderness moment. We had the opportunity, my lovely bride and I, to uh, go snowboarding. Where's all the skiers in the room? Come on. I'm proud of you. That's phenomenal. I, I couldn't pick up skiing, but how many of y'all snowboard? Like, okay, not as many. Okay, great. We got, okay, perfect. So we picked up snowboarding pretty quick. She was like an X game pro. Like, it was shocking how fast she got. She's like, this is really easy. She's like, this is, fast. I'm like, because when I fall, it's a, it's a far drop. Like it's, it's, and so we, we got all this training and we were ready to go. But intermediate, novice, expert, professional, I would put her in the novice to a little higher. And I, I was still on like, well, how many more times are we going to go down this bunny ramp one before we can go up there? And so we met with some friends and they were ridiculous. Like they had like matching outfits and they said things like, oh, it's awesome. Like we had a nice dusting last night, 50 inches of dust on the ground. I'm like, it's ridiculous. And so we get on the ski lift and it's taking us up and I'm starting to feel a little like, like and we're getting really high. Like we We've never been up this high before. And I'm like, I'm like, are you starting to have a tough time breathing? And she's like, it's the altitude, but we're gonna go down. I'm like, how do you go down? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I can't catch my breath. Can't catch my breath. And then in snowboarding, for those of you who know, you keep one foot not uh, hooked in and you keep one hooked to the board. And I don't know what happened. I feel like this ski lift was moving a little faster. Like they had a new guy on there that cranked it up because I'm watching everybody like jump off. And even people that were good were still having a little problem. And I said, I'm going to bite it. I can already tell you right now. And I dug the front of my board into the snow and it launched me. And I just, boom, hit the ground. And people were around like, <laughs> and so... So I kind of slide myself off to the side because this thing is not stopping. It's like a conveyor, but, but she jumps off and she's just like, this is unbelievable. So we're in this beautiful landscape, high in this mountain. And I asked the guy that was working the lift, hey, what, how, do you get, like, how do you get down if you don't want to go down? He's like, on a stretcher. There's no other way down. You got to go down it. And I said, what is this? He said, it's a black diamond. For those of you who know, this is the highest of the high. And there is so much snow blowing, I'm having a tough time seeing him. And she's like, look at me, look at me. And we're trying to encourage each other. And she's pretty calm. And she's like hitting me with her snow glove. And she's like, pull it together, Groves. Like, I'm not losing you today. And so my puffer jacket's a little too much. And I'm just like, where are they at? And our friends were like, see you at dinner. And they just dive off the side of the mountain. They're professionals. So we took a moment to take in the beauty of the wilderness. And then she's like, we got to go. And so we jump off the side, y'all. And we are, this is scary. Like we are weaving in and out and having to stop. And we're like, we can't get down. This is, we unhooked and we tried to like walk down and we ended up deep like up here in snow. We're like, this is not going to work. And so we pulled ourselves out and at a few times, so this is key, we're in the wilderness. I almost fell off the mountain. Like, see you, Jackie. Like it was, 
It was so crazy and took us so long to get down. What should have taken nine to 12 minutes, it, we were into the hours. The sun was starting to set. I'm having conversations like, look at me. If we die, you have to eat me. She's like, that's extreme. That's extreme. We're not even to that point yet. I'm like, but you eat me first. And she's like, opposed to what? I'm like, what are we doing? But I remember we ended up having a couple moments where the snow started to die down and the sun was diving. And I'm like, We're, I'm going to get eaten by a bear. I can already tell. But we just took a breath and said, God, we trust you. And we actually were encouraging each other. And we actually found peace because it was so quiet up there. And we chose to have a moment. And then we ended up finding our way back to the trail. And we found some signs. And very slowly, we made our way to the bottom, even though Ski Patrol was up in the mountains searching for us. And then we never talked to those people again. They have been deleted from all forms of communication. Why are you telling us that? Number two, we found the worth in the wilderness. Even in the midst of the chaos, we still were able to experience peace. We were still able to experience moments where we said, God, we see you. And God, we know that you are our protector. And here's the thing that I've learned in the wilderness seasons. Now, that was a real wilderness mountaintop moment. But in the seasons of life, one of the most amazing, reassuring things we can experience is knowing that the presence of God is present with you. You're never alone. I talked to somebody the other day and he said, man, I just feel so alone. I said, you're never alone. I said, when's the last time, instead of getting in your car and cranking up music, you got quiet? And just said, Lord, I, I need you. He said, it's, I can't remember when. I said, try that next time. And watch the presence of God reveal his presence to you so much that you'll realize you're never alone. The worth in the wilderness is that oftentimes it will force a total dependency on God. It's a place where your ability to self-provide or self-secure is totally stripped away. And the makeup of our humanity, because this is what we do, we compartmentalize. You, you say, God, open-handed, I can't do this in my own strength. In the history of walking with the Lord and being on this earth, every single time I've tried to do it in my own strength, things end up unraveling. Wave at me if you say you agree. Come on. Because we have a, we got to hustle. We got to wake up. I bet on me sort of mentality. But good luck doing that your whole life. Because it will unravel at some point. Because just so you know, you're not that good. And you're not that good on your own. I know I'm stepping on somebody's toes. You're like, you don't know me. Listen, even all of your degrees is because of the breath that's in your lungs from the one who provided it. He gave you what you need, the IQ, the EQ, everything you need. We have to start redirecting it back to the Lord and say, God, I can't do this on my own. And that's a really great opportunity for the Lord to step in. So going back to the journey of the Israelites, God's plan in the wilderness was for them to regain a perspective that was necessary for them to thrive in the blessing that God had promised to deliver. Throughout this journey, the Israelites would learn some really valuable lessons. I can speak on behalf of my wife. We've learned some very valuable lessons and uncomfortable lessons. But we've also learned more about the nature of God. We've also learned more about the nature of his word and his promise to fulfill. This verse in Exodus 13 is fascinating to me, and it proves that God's way is so much better. Exodus 13, 17 says, when Pharaoh, it's on the screens, finally let the people go. Pharaoh's like, you guys get out of here with this bald head. Somebody you're like, you know that's what he looked like? Prince of Egypt. Um, it says that God did not, this is key, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though it was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and go back to Egypt where they were held captive, where they were once slaves. It's like you're on Waze or you know, you Apple Maps or Map, or like Google Maps or you print off the MapQuest sheets. I don't know your life. Like you're trying to figure, how many of y'all take the one that says you can save three minutes right here? You click on that. Cause you're gonna go the shortest route. But you know, there's been some times where I've said, I'm gonna take that shortest route and something happened on the shortest route. A truck just fell over. 
tangerines went everywhere and you're stuck for hours. Somebody like, that's very specific. It happened to me. And then they wouldn't let us take any of the tangerines. You know what I mean? Like, anyways, I was like, it's vitamin C, it's free. Okay. But God knew, and God has a purpose for the path that he chooses to take you down. And while the Israelites didn't know it yet, they were witnessing the wisdom of God on full display. But what's crazy is this. In the next chapter, it says that God led the Israelites away from the shortcut, right? And instead, he placed them up against the Red Sea. How many of y'all know this story? And the sea was impossible and uncrossable. And now they've got the entire, they got the entire army under Pharaoh's regime falling into and hemming them against this area that is uncrossable. And they're looking at Moses like, now what? And they're facing the sea. Can I say this to you right now? Don't be surprised when God's best leads you to an impossible situation. Don't be surprised when that integrous choice that you made in business puts you in an impossible place. But also take heart in this. God is not limited by the sea that you stand in front of. That impossible situation, y'all, we serve the God of the impossible. No, no, no. We serve the God of the possible who shows up and says, I can part these seas. I can show up and open up doors that hustling can't open up for you. I can show up and put favor on you that you will never say, well, I just have good luck. No, you walk in fog, y'all, the favor of God. There is not a seed that you stand in front of that God can't show up and move. Fast forward, Exodus 17, where we see God make water out of a rock. They're complaining, like, I'm parched. I need some aquafina. At least a deer park. By the way, how many of y'all are like a little bougie on your water? You're like, I love Evian water. Evian tastes like somebody washed their hands with lotion and put it in a bottle. It's real smooth. You're like, what? I don't know what's in that. And then Deer Park, let's talk about water for a minute. If you're from Deer Park, I want to talk to you because it tastes like a deer laid in the water and then got up and you're like, let's bottle that. They'll buy it. So they're complaining. We don't have any water. And God uses Moses to strike a rock and he gives them refreshment. Later on, the Israelites are ambushed and outmatched by the Amalekites, and God commands a victory on behalf of them and shows his righteous right hand and protects them. We see all these lessons that needed to be learned so that when God delivered the promise, it wouldn't come at the expense of the praises of his people. Here's the truth. It all belongs to God anyways. I have talked to our team. We talked to our kids. Y'all, we have to start redirecting all glory, praise, and honor to him because it all belongs to him anyways. I love this interview they did with Brooke Frazier. Brooke Frazier wrote the song, Beautiful Name. Beautiful name, it is the name of Jesus. Phenomenal song. And she said she was starting to feel overwhelmed by people that would walk up to her and be like, we love this song. I'm so glad you wrote that song. You're an amazing songwriter. Thank you for writing that song. And she said she would always redirect it. Like, oh, no, oh gosh, oh gosh, no. And she said one day the Lord said, it's okay to accept a compliment. It's okay to receive that affirmation. And she said she almost saw a vision of her receiving a flower. Every compliment was like a flower. She would take these flowers, and at the end of the day, she would have this huge bouquet, and she said she would go into her room, hotel room, the bus, wherever she was at. She said, I would get on my knees every night and take those compliments, all those words of affirmation, all those pats on the back, and I would lay them at the king's feet and say, this all belongs to you. I give it back to you. All the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. That promotion, give him praise for it. That opportunity, give him praise for it. That closed door that's actually for your protection, give him praise for it. That toxic relationship that rolled out, give him praise for navigating that situation on your behalf. God showed up and said, hey, I'm gonna provide, but at the end of the day, I will receive the praise and all the glory and all the honor, but we have to be in a position where we lay it at his feet. John 3.30 says this, he must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. We have to allow God's presence, his, his purpose, his revelation, his power to overtake our lives so that we can find provision, protection, and the potential that we can walk out. That we never could, ex- we could, we could have never experienced this in our own strength or in our, with our own selves and our own beings. That's where ego and pride gets in the way. I need you to get this. The wilderness is worth it. I'm telling you, I'm a product of it. The wilderness is worth it. I feel stronger and bolder 
I feel like there's wisdom and clarity and things that I would have never gotten if I, everything was just polished. And some of y'all are like, my life has never been like that. It's always been the wilderness where you're in good company because God took some of his greatest men and women of faith through wilderness moments before they came out on the other side and walked out in great victory. So give God praise. Come on. But when's, what ends up happening, bringing this in for landing, what ends up happening is we end up living afraid. I said it earlier, in a little twisted way, we end up finding comfort in that captivity. We end up living afraid and we don't want to ever leave Egypt because the wilderness seems scary, but it's worth it. The wilderness was a training ground, again, to restore, realign, and rehabilitate the Israelites' hearts to God. It's God's pathway. and was his pathway to ensure that they could inhabit the land that he desired to give them. And here's the truth. Another level often requires another qualification. And another qualification often requires another wilderness, but it will be what you choose to make it. So take heart, like the Israelites experienced, there may not be water, but you will never thirst. He will provide refreshment. They didn't have food and God provided manna every day and quail every day, a fire by night to keep them warm and a cloud by day to keep them cool every day. But every day they panicked. Is it gonna run out? Because that's how we do in humanity. Well, but if I give this, if I'm generous, if I start tithing, then what if I don't have enough? Every day, say every day. It says that he will give you, this is the day of our daily bread. He gives you daily bread every day. But what ended up happening is the Israelites started hoarding the manna. They're like, don't you touch that, that's my manna. I put a Sharpie, I put my name on it. And then what ended up happening is overnight, worms would begin to come out of it and it would rot because God wanted true and total dependency in him. So every day he provided. Some of y'all are walking around, this is gonna sound really gross, this statement, walking around with worms coming out of your life. You're like, that sounds like something you need an antibiotic for. That is, no, it's but you've been hoarding. You've been hoarding what God has provided and said, God, but what if you never provide again? I'm telling you, he'll provide every day if you'll trust him. Look at the person next to you and say, he's gonna provide every day if you trust him. Because when you have nothing, I found this to be real and real true. When giants are in the land, God promises to protect. When there is a season of lack, God promises he'll provide. And when you feel like you're in a wilderness season and you feel like you have nothing, God can become everything. Because if he's not the Lord of everything, then he's not the Lord of anything. And we have to trust God and Maybe you're here and you would say, yeah, but here's the truth. I kind of want to opt out of this wilderness season. I said that earlier. Like, I trust God, but I want to opt out. I trust God, but I want to avoid the wilderness season, but I also want to control the narrative, and I want to give maybe. I don't know if this whole tithing thing or giving thing is for me. I trust God, but I don't want the wilderness, and, and, I, and I trust God, but when my kids ask if they can go to youth group, like, what's really the benefit? It's a waste of my time to drive them over there 20 minutes. Like, I trust God, but I don't know. I don't want to experience the wilderness, but I ultimately want to navigate and be the authority of what's allowed in my house, on my screen, in my marriage, and I just want to do me, and it's okay if I'm gray in some areas and not righteous in others. No, no, no. Strap your boots on, lace them up because you're gonna go through some wilderness seasons and they will either stretch you and train you and grow you or you'll buckle and cave and find comfort in it. Some of you are like, whoa, this is really heavy because when you again try to control and try to navigate the outcome, yet you still want God's best for your life. Listen, he might have to mess up your plans so that you don't mess up your life. He might have to mess up your plans so your plans don't mess you over. In five to seven years, you look back and say, why didn't I just include the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper? The wilderness, again, is the in-between season, between the last season and the next promise. And there's a conditioning that takes place in the middle. I said it a moment ago, a place called there never will happen if we remain here. We have to find the middle season. Have you ever driven from Houston to Dallas? Come on. How many of y'all are like, as little as possible? <laughs> like, all right, real quick, just, just a poll for me personally. I want to see what kind of church we pastor. How many of y'all are still cheering for the Texas Rangers because it's the Texas team? Four of you. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I'm proud. I'm proud of you. Some of you are like, I also root for the Dallas Cowboys and I love cats. I get it. <laughs> just double checking. <laughs> Okay. 
Now, when you try to drive from Houston to Dallas, there's a lot of in-betweens. And you can stop. You can stop at the largest hand-dug well. I don't know if that's real. <laughs> there's some other things along the way, like a 14-foot idol in the shape of a, of a beaver that we always stop at. And you walk in, you're like, I don't even eat fudge, but I need three pounds of mint chocolate fudge. And I also need two pounds of ostrich jerky. I don't know why. The in-between is real. But the truth is that that journey in between that four hour drive is necessary with nothing remarkable in the middle. Sometimes we don't take that approach when it comes to life. We think when we leave a job, there has to be a job butted right up against it. We, we think that when we leave a relationship, we have to have a relationship come along right away to fill that void. That's called a rebound. But sometimes the middle season, the waiting season, the worth and the wait to see God's faithfulness in the wilderness season is actually really vital so instead of getting frustrated and confused when the seasons don't end up right up against each other, rather than complaining and getting anxious, the response of every believer should be, Lord, what are you trying to teach me along the way? Close your eyes right now and just say that. Say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me along the way? Because it's something that we have to grab because the real beauty that I want our hearts to be drawn to today is this. Here's the great news. We have an answer in the wilderness Every single time. Number three, the way in the wilderness is Jesus. The end of it all, the answer begins with and ends with Jesus. That is the beginning of our foundation anchor verse. I will make a way in the wilderness. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The wilderness will not be your end if Jesus is your Lord. Going back to our anchor verse on the screens, I'm doing a new thing. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm doing it. He's doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not see it or perceive it? For I am, that's Jesus' words, making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Close your eyes just for a moment. God, I thank you today. For those who are maybe in a wilderness season and there's a weight that feels heavy, it's fear-filled and has a lot of anxiety and restless nights connected to it. God, I pray that the weight in the wilderness is lifting and that they could see the worth in the wilderness. That they, God, could see the beauty of your amazing hand navigating it. God, that there would be no more anxiety, panic attacks, and sleepless nights. God, I pray that they redirect the weight in the wilderness to you and they see the worth. They see you equipping, providing, protecting, building, restoring, realigning, rehabilitating, and us in the middle of this season. And God, I thank you that at the end of all of it, that we see that you are making a way in the wilderness, that the answer, when we rely, depend, and truly trust you, you are the way in the wilderness. Would you stand on your feet for just a moment? And if you're here today, maybe you're in a wilderness season and you would say, I've been wearing the weight of that. Would you just begin to lift your hands and put that in the Lord's hands and say, I'm, I'm redirecting the weight, the fear, the anxiety, the concern, the, the pressing, the overwhelming feeling like I'm drowning. I put it in the hands of God. And then I want you to that very quickly, if this is the next part, you're like, I want to see the worth in the wilderness. I don't want to just go through it, but Pastor Daniel, I want to grow through it. Would you lift your hands? I pray, God, that they would see the beauty of all that you're doing, everything you're equipping, because you're taking them from here to there. And this wilderness season is necessary for them to grow and to become who they are called to be. Moms, dads, future moms, dads, grandparents, husband, wives, future husbands and wives, God, and friends and family. God, we trust you even when we can't fully track you. And God, we thank you. The fear is not my future. You are you are you are you are heartbreak heartbreak's not my home you are you are death is not the end you are come on lift your hands towards heaven and say fear is not my future fear is not my future you are you are Sickness is not my story. You are, you are. Heartbreak, heartbreak's not my home. You are, you are. Death is not the end. The death is not the end. You are, hello, you are. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. Hello, strength. Hello, 
says a better day's coming. Come on, the wilderness lasts for a season and morning lasts for a moment, but his joy comes in the morning. There's a new horizon. Come on, how many of y'all are ready to step in to that new horizon that God is providing and revealing? Put your hands down for a moment. If you're here and you would say, Daniel, I needed this. I needed this because the truth is I felt like the wilderness season is a punishment season. Here's the truth. You do behave your way in and behave your way out. There are things that are blocking the blessing in your life. Maybe it's because you refuse to release what's in your hands. Maybe you're holding on to bitterness or unforgiveness. or Maybe you have been wearing like a badge of shame, misery, and brokenness. Instead of walking in your position, you've been walking in your condition. And here's the truth. The wilderness season is real. But you choose what you take from that season. Because here's the reality. If you are alive and you're breathing, you will go through a wilderness season in your life. And you can choose to cower in a corner and say the weight is too heavy or you can redirect it to the God who created you and can handle all of it. And then we see the worth. We see the worth in the middle of it and say, God, this is pushing me and empowering me to trust you, to give you full control and relinquish control. And then trust fully on the one who will make a way in the wilderness. With every eye closed, though, if you're here and you'd say, Daniel, here's the truth. I've been in the wilderness for a long time because I don't have a savior. I don't know who to call on. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that when you call upon the name of the Lord and you confess him, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. He's about to heal, restore, and write victory in your story. Maybe the second invitation. And you say, Daniel, here's the truth. I used to walk with the Lord, but I am now literally living, camping out and stuck in a wilderness season because I'm buried under the weight. Because I haven't called upon the name of the Lord because of shame and condemnation. And today, I want to redirect all of that back to the Lord and rededicate my life to Jesus. I'm going to count to three. If you're watching at the Woodlands, if you're watching at Katie, if you're part of our H crew, H crew, you can say yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus or rededicate. Our team will help you. But here at West Houston and across all of our other campuses, when I count to three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand and say, you're talking about me. I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Or two, I want to rededicate my life. One, two, three. Would you lift up your hand. I'm looking all over the room. Today's my day. I see you and you and you and you. I saw you. Amazing. Anybody else who say you're talking about me? I see you right here. Amazing. I see you. Phenomenal. Come on, Hope City. We can give God praise better than that. There was five people just in this service. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me. It's simply not working from this moment on. I'm choosing to live for you. Here's all my shame. Here's all my issues. Here's all my struggles. I ask for your forgiveness. Here's all my sin. It doesn't belong to me. You paid the price for it. Jesus, thank you for exchanging your life for mine so that I can live a life of freedom. I give you the praise. I give you all the glory. You are my Father. You're my Savior. And you are my Lord. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise?